did Ellen White describe the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as the, quote, three holiest beings? In a sermon from 1906, Ellen White is recorded as saying the phrase, three holiest beings, but many anti-Trinitarians claim that this quote is not true, that she did not say this. So in this video, we are going to look at this specific quote and the historical evidence. The reason why many anti-Trinitarians react so strongly is because they believe that the teaching that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead is Luciferian. If you claim or if you teach that the Holy Spirit is a distinct divine person, then in their view, you are worshiping Lucifer and you have made Lucifer to be like God, which is really serious. This is why they call into question the historical validity of this statement. And for those of you who just want a quick summary, here it is. Yes, the evidence is overwhelming that she did say this. And yes, you will see many, you will see multiple examples of anti-Trinitarians out of their own mouth making inaccurate, misleading, or false claims. Now, of course, not every anti-Trinitarian does this, but many do so, and they do so very publicly, so it is necessary to publicly respond to public false claims. The, the core fundamental problem here is that anti-Trinitarians reject and deny that the Holy Spirit is a distinct person. One of their main claims is that the Holy Spirit is somehow kind of a person or a, a person but not a being. Anti-Trinitarian arguments generally state that the Father is a person and that the Son is a person, but that the Holy Spirit is somehow kind of a person because according to them, the Holy Spirit is not actually his own person, but the Holy Spirit is actually Jesus. In other words, the Father is a person, the Son is a person, but the third person is actually not a third person because in reality, according to them, he is actually the second person. If that seems confusing to you, here's a fair analogy. There is an apple, an orange, and a banana. The apple is a fruit, the orange is a fruit, but the banana is not actually a fruit because the banana is actually the orange. According to their claims, that is a fair analogy. In fact, as I was preparing this video, someone stated it again. See it for yourself. The Holy Spirit is a person because it is the Spirit of the Father and Son. And also the Father is a person, but the Holy Spirit is not another person from the Father and Son. To which I replied, translation, the banana is a fruit because the orange is a fruit and the apple is a fruit, but the banana is not another fruit. Now, maybe some of you watching this video think that that doesn't make any sense, but they say this because, according to them, there is a difference, a significant difference between being a person and a being. Now, incidentally, the topic of abortion is very helpful to understand this because, and this is really interesting, anti-Trinitarian and pro-abortion arguments are very similar, which, as you will see, also have serious implications. Rejecting the Holy Spirit is a very serious issue. A common argument for abortion is to say that the unborn child is a being but not a person. They admit that yes, there is something inside that mother. Most if not all admit that there is a quote life in the womb, but that this life does not have the magical status of personhood. When we ask them, well, what is it then, a kangaroo? They have never given an answer as to what exactly it is, but they are just so sure and certain that it is not a person. We don't know what it is, but it's definitely not a person. If you ask the question how and when it obtains the status of person or personhood, their favorite answer is to say, the nature of the unborn is a mystery. When questioned, anti-Trinitarians will say the exact same thing. The nature of the Holy Spirit is a mystery. Now, for those people supporting abortion, it is easier for them to say that this being in the mother is not a person because not all beings are persons. Kangaroos and turtles are beings, but not persons. The anti-Trinitarian, however, has quite a challenge because they argue that a person is not a being. This is an impossible task because nowhere in the Bible is a person ever not a being. A person is always a being, just like an orange is always a fruit. 
This brings us to the quote by Ellen White from a sermon preached in Oakland, California on Sabbath afternoon, October 20th, 1906. The context of this quote is important as you will see in a minute. At the very beginning of the message, Mrs. White gets straight to the point. She says, Mark especially the words, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. Oh, that these words might sink deep into the heart of every one of you who think that you are doing God's service while finding fault with others. This is the weakness, the besetting sin of many in this congregation. And our great desire is that you shall get rid of this evil before the Lord gets rid of you. So, very strong words. Ellen White is referring to fault finding as a sin that needed to be addressed in this Oakland church. She continues, and this is the paragraph just prior to the statement that we will look at. She says, There has come into the churches of Oakland the spirit of backbiting, of fault finding, and evil speaking, which demonstrates that you are not converted. Words are uttered that never should pass the lips of a Christian. And she quotes from Romans chapter 15, which reads, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by who? By the Holy Ghost. Immediately continuing, she now says this, Here is where the work of the Holy Ghost comes in. After your baptism, you are baptized in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. You are raised up out of the water to live a new life. You are born unto God, and you stand under the sanction and the power of the three holiest beings in heaven who are able to keep you from falling. You are to reveal that you are dead to sin. Your life is hid with Christ in God. Hidden with Christ in God. Wonderful transformation. This is a most precious promise. When I feel oppressed and hardly know how to relate myself toward the work that God has given me to do, I just call upon the who? Upon the three great worthies, bringing me into a position where my spirit shall be susceptible to the movings of the Holy Spirit of God upon my mind and character. And this is the prayer that every one of us may offer. Okay, so there it is from the record Ellen White's sermon in Oakland, Sabbath afternoon, October 20th, 1906. Now, if you go online right now and search the phrase, Three Holiest Beings, Ellen White, many of the websites that pop up are by anti-Trinitarians, and I want you to pay close attention to what they say. Here are several examples. Ellen White did not pen these words by her own hand. They were written by a stenographer trying to keep up with a sermon, trying to keep up. While some claim that Ellen White wrote Three Holiest Beings, the Ellen White estate clearly, notice the word clearly, clearly informs us on their website that the phrase Three Holiest Beings comes from a highly edited, all caps, stenographer's report. That is false. Notice that they don't provide any link or reference to the website. The date of release by the White estate is March 1976. So, this was not her handwriting, but a typed report from a stenographer that was first published 70 years after her sermon and can never be authenticated. That is false. Mr. Nadur Mansur here, who has published falsehoods on other topics elsewhere, will he tell the truth about this? Here he is promoting his book, Putting the Pieces Together, which says, when comparing this report with published writings, we see that a slight reporting error happened. As is the case to this day, he says the same thing, Mrs. White did not write the words, Three Holiest Beings, at all. Check this out here. We shall now examine closely what the record reveals and let all men be informed of the facts of the matter. Now, my friends, that's very important. Non-Trinitarians like to claim that it's all about the facts. Remember that. Informed of the facts. Just keep that in your mind. Let's continue. So this is a very honest admission from the White estate telling us that Mrs. White did not pen those words. Rather, they were a report of what she said. It is very obvious, oh, it's obvious, that a slight mistake was made in reporting this sermon. And here we go, remember this one. There is no, there is no evidence that can prove that Mrs. White ever checked the words three holiest beings because she had been dead for a long time. That is false. That is not true. Remember, Mr. Nadeur claims that it's all about the facts and that there is no evidence that she could have checked her words. Just remember that. 
And this site right here, this is the only instance in the Spirit of Prophecy that she refers to the Holy Spirit as a being. This manuscript is the work of a stenographer who is present at the sermon. Based on number one and two, it is reasonable, actually, no it's not, to conclude that it was not written accurately. Now, to those of you watching this video, anti-Trinitarians really don't like this quote because they themselves admit out of their own mouth, as Adrian Evans does here, that it would appear to discredit all that they say. And fearing that they will be discredited, they make the claim that the sermon was only transcribed by a listener in the audience and not published until after her death in 1976 and here again on another site, it was highly edited. To admit, to make the admission that an orange is a fruit, that a person is a being, is so damaging that anti-Trinitarians cannot allow this quote to go unchallenged. As you can see, I quoted from them out of their own mouth, and there are basically four arguments. Number one, the report was highly edited. Number two, Ellen White never reviewed this sermon. Number three, the report was not published until after she died. And number four, the stenographer made an error. Now, remember, according to them, it's all about the revealed record and the facts of the matter. That's great. Let's look at the facts. Was it highly edited? The answer is, yes it was, by, guess who? Ellen White herself. They claim that it was highly edited, but they don't provide any source for the highly edited quote. You notice that? And they don't tell you that it was Ellen White. They try to present this in a way to suggest that her statements have been tampered with or altered. This sermon in question was given on October 20th, 1906, and just seven weeks later, the exact same sermon was published right here in the Review and Herald on December 13th. You can see it for yourself, page nine, first column, right there, the work in Oakland and San Francisco. And who's the author? By Mrs. E.G. White. Now, not all of the sermon was published, but approximately 30% of it was. The 70% that was not published contained the phrase in question. Remember, it is publicly claimed there is no evidence that can prove that Mrs. White ever checked the words three holiest beings, and she could not check this sermon because she had been dead for a long time. This is, of course, false. This is not true. Ellen White died in 1915. This was published in 1906, nine years before she died. She was very much alive. The claim that the typed report from the stenographer was first published 70 years later is not accurate because you can see for yourself pictures right here from the White Estate of Ellen White's 1906 letter book, which contains manuscript 95 and exhibit number 18. You can see for yourself right here a scan of the manuscript's first page identifying the document here as Sermon, Sabbath afternoon, October 20th, Oakland, California. And here is exhibit number 19, which is the scan of the page containing the phrase, three holiest beings. You can see the phrase right here in the second paragraph. And you will also notice there are obvious corrections made here and here, demonstrating that someone reviewed this for errors before publishing this report. Someone corrects the word dishonor, and a space is to be added here so that it reads Christ in God rather than Christ in as one word. These are doubtless corrections made by the stenographer typing up the sermon. So for those of you watching this video who might be new to this history, when Ellen White died, there were many letters and manuscripts that had not yet been published. Quote, at the time of Ellen White's death in 1915, the manuscript and letter files in the Elmshaven vault contained 40,000 pages of Ellen White documents in typewritten form. And later, the White estate would begin publishing these manuscripts. Now, this particular record of her sermon is manuscript 95, and although it was officially released in March of 1976, for the general public, this does not mean that Ellen White did not have access to it or that she did not use it for her article in the review. Anti-Trinitarians, they try to distort or present this in such a way to make it appear that even Ellen White may not have known about this manuscript and that she never saw it and never could have seen it because she had been dead a long time. And this is exactly why anti-Trinitarians never talk about the December 13th article because 
If they even admit this, then they will have to explain how, how Ellen White was able to multiple times quote verbatim from her sermon. And because she did do so, then there had to exist some typed record of what she said. And if this typed record existed, then she would have used this and she would have seen the phrase, the three holiest beings. Furthermore, as evidence that this was carefully reviewed, here is a graph of the sermon in blue. We can then highlight the sections of the sermon that she used in her article and highlight those as yellow. In other words, the blue section that you see is the unpublished and the yellow section was published. As you can see, sometimes she used entire paragraphs and sections and sometimes just a few sentences. For example, this little sliver of yellow here represents these two sentences from her article here, which are a direct verbatim quote. Like much, but not all of her article, this is a literal word for word quote, exactly the same as in the sermon. Now the phrase three holiest beings, if we highlight that section in orange, it looks like this. As you can see, not only did Ellen White cite from her sermon both before and immediately after, but she also cites the end of her message as well, which is objective, historical, undeniable evidence that Ellen White did in fact review the record of her sermon and did use that for her article just a few weeks later. Also, this article in the review has approximately just over 2,000 words. And if you compare the sermon to the article, she includes over 1,800 words from the sermon and many of these statements are verbatim quotes. Now, stop and ask yourself the question. This is a very important question. When Ellen White sat down to write this article and when she included quotes from her October sermon, what percentage of those quotes are verbatim? Are you ready for this? Over 99.6%. Almost every single time that Ellen White quoted the manuscript, it is a verbatim quote. There are only a few instances where words were changed. For example, in the sermon, she says, we want to be Bible Christians. But in the article, she says, we are to be Bible Christians. In the sermon, she says, then we shall have that help and that power which God alone can give to us. This is changed to, then we shall have the help and the power that God alone can give. Oftentimes during the seasons is changed to, at times during the seasons. So in other words, to visualize this, the yellow section that you see here where she quotes, over 99% of this yellow section are verbatim from the record. And when there are a few changes made, all of them are very minor. And this is very important because this demonstrates that Ellen White either possessed a fantastic memory where she could remember her exact words, or this is an instance of God making her write exactly what she had said in October, or she actually had this typed record of her sermon in her possession and she read through it. And just like every other author, she chose sections that she wanted to include in her article. Over 99% verbatim, but not only do anti-Trinitarians ignore that she wrote this, but they would have everyone to believe that she never interacted with this at all. And here is yet another example. There is a video online trialogue with Pastor David Ashrick and Ty Gibson and a man named Brendan Valiant. Mr. Brendan published a document online several years ago wherein he brings attention to the sermon in Oakland and the phrase three holiest beings. He then admits admits that the Ellen White estate released scanned copies of the relevant pages, but that these, focusing just on the pages, contain no evidence that she interacted with this transcript, which is true, but he is ignoring the December 13th article. Several years later, he published an email exchange with Pastor Ty Gibson, where Mr. Brendan made a bigger claim, quote, there is no evidence that Ellen White reviewed the manuscript. Well, guess what? I personally contacted Mr. Brendan who said that this email was from 2018 and his document was published in 2016. The problem, however, notice very carefully the dates, pay attention to the years. The problem is that this release from the Ellen White estate, which he admits to knowing about, is dated 2012 and specifically mentions the historical evidence that Ellen used portions of the sermon for an article that she herself wrote. So contrary to the inaccurate claims made repeatedly by anti-Trinitarians, we know for a fact 
that Ellen White did interact with the record of her sermon. Furthermore, also notice something else that they try. Some of these people are totally shameless and just deny this and make blatantly false claims, while others try to be a bit more slick. They want to give this impression to people's minds, but knowing that it's not defensible, they try to add a little qualifier. Notice the parenthetical statement, no personal notations appear. He makes the claim that there is no evidence that she reviewed the manuscript, but because she did do so for her article in the review, and because admitting that would be so damaging, he ignores this and tries to limit his claim only to the actual pieces of scanned paper and says, see, there are no personal handwritten notes here. Now, this would be remarkable except for the fact that as you saw for yourself, anti-Trinitarians do this constantly and publicly over and over and over again, make all sorts of false and misleading claims and then ignore evidence or just claim that there is no evidence at all. Furthermore, that she reviewed this manuscript and made no personal notes is strong evidence that there is nothing wrong. Anyways, moving on, next is the claim that the stenographer made an error. It is very obvious that a slight mistake was made in reporting this sermon. Anti-Trinitarians do not want to allow this, so they try to cast as much shade and doubt and suspicion as possible. Some even try to downplay the significance of a stenographer by saying it was only transcribed by a listener in the audience, as if, you know, random people in 1906 just show up and transcribe entire sermons, as if random folks in Oakland, California just walk around waiting to transcribe messages from Ellen White. So we looked at these first three points and they are all either false or misleading. This fourth one, that the stenographer made an error. Now just take a moment to stop and think that through. Number one, Ellen White was arguably one of the most accomplished and effective public speakers of her time who received praise even from non-Adventist audiences for her ability to speak clearly and be understood even at great distances from the platform. Dr. Herbert Douglas, Messenger of the Lord, page 125, a minister reporting on his experience at the 1874 Biblical Institute in Battle Creek, wrote about James and Ellen White, I venture the assertion that no fine-minded person can listen to either of them and not feel assured that God is with them. Sister White's style and language is altogether solemn and impressive. L.H. Christian heard Ellen White for the first time in Minneapolis in 1888. He said in his comments that later at a conference I had a chance to test her voice. She was standing on the large platform in the front addressing an audience of 5,000 people. And I said to myself they can never hear in the rear so as to know what she is saying. Slipping out I walked outside the tent to the rear and when I came in and stood behind the great crowd I could hear every word and almost what? Hear almost what? almost every syllable of every word just as plainly as I could up in the front. SPS Edwards, a physician, described Ellen White's speaking voice as deep contralto with a wonderful carrying power. We could always hear her. Everyone could hear always, whether it was 10,000 outdoors or a lonely heart in the privacy of her own room. In 1957-59, to 59, Dr. Horace Shaw, longtime professor of speech at now Andrews University, analyzed 465 speeches and interviewed 366 people who had heard Ellen White speak. His massive academic paper over 600 pages of evaluating her public speaking makes the following conclusion. The listeners in the audience reported that her words penetrated far because they were rounded, clearly enunciated, spoken slowly, and given with a force that lent an element of authority and impressiveness. Sister White spoke simply and distinctly and enunciated each syllable distinctly. Her articulation was perfect. Others said the same thing, perfect enunciation and careful. 168 respondents used words grouped with the phrase with clarity, distinct pronunciation, and plainly. James White, her articulation is so distinct 
the acres of people here outside as easily as if seated in a church. Enunciation was crystal clear. In an article for the record, The Secret World of the Court Stenographer, stenographers need to develop the ability to have a blank mind, to focus on the present and hear the words coming in. I listen to each word, so there are times when the court has burst out laughing and I haven't known what the joke is. They are so focused on hearing sounds that when something funny is said, they don't get it. Ellen White was arguably one of the most gifted and effective public speakers probably in the last several hundred years, if not more. And there is nothing but unanimous testimony affirming her extraordinary clarity and enunciation. But these anti-Trinitarians would have you to believe that a stenographer who is trained in the specific skill of transcribing words and who, sitting nearby, listening to a speaker with crystal clear distinct pronunciation, somehow made this glaring mistake and recorded, you are born unto God and you stand under the sanction and power of the three holiest beings in heaven, when, according to them, it was not beings, but something else. Even though, at this very moment, moment, notice very carefully, she specifically makes reference to all three, both immediately before and after, when Ellen White said, you are baptized in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. They don't dispute that. When Ellen White says, when I feel oppressed, I just call upon the three great worthies, no dispute there, no. They zero in on just this one word begins and claim that this was an error. Okay, that's fine. Let's just take a moment to stop and think this through. For the sake of argument, let's suppose that this is an error. This is where it gets really interesting because if beings is not the right word, if this is a mistake, then what is the right word? If she said something, but it was not beings, then what other word could it possibly be? When the stenographer is listening to a woman speaking with great enunciation and clarity, then what word in the English language sounds like the word beings and would be an appropriate replacement? Three holiest kneeling, three holiest fleeing, but I don't want to share with you my speculations. Let's listen to the anti-Trinitarians themselves. While I don't dispute that Ellen White said something like these words, they may not have been her exact words. For example, in a shorthand system which leaves out vowels and where B and P are simply a matter of length of line, beings and persons could easily be mixed up. Okay, so vowels are not used by stenographers and the B and P might be mixed up. Okay, let's apply this. If it's not B, then maybe it's a P. Three holiest peings. What do you think? Does that fit the context of the sermon? Or maybe because the vowels are wrong. Maybe it's pyings, payings, poings, or you guessed it, pooings. Now, my friends, I don't know about you, but I personally am not convinced that peeing and pooing are suitable or appropriate replacements. And then please don't take my word for it. Please go ask them yourselves. Go ask anti-Trinitarians, if not beings, then what other word could Ellen White have said? If your experience is anything like mine, they will not even attempt to provide anything because nothing fits. Over and over again, they will tell you, just as they told me many times, that they are just so sure and certain that this is wrong. They know that the stenographer made an error. They know that this is wrong because it does not agree with their preconceived ideas. Remember, they are the ones making the charge and accusation, so they have the burden of providing actual evidence to substantiate their accusation. But the problem is that the only, the only claim that anti-Trinitarians have to deny this statement is their own opinion. That's it. That's all that they have. Now, to be fair, let's consider that maybe they are right. Maybe this is an error. Maybe the stenographer did record the wrong word. However, in order to make that claim, we need to have actual evidence. And as of right now, there is nothing. Now, maybe in the future, some Adventist historian or professor, maybe some janitor somewhere will be cleaning out some old dusty box or drawer and come across another stenographer report, which will be found of the exact same sermon, which records three holiest 
something else. And then, in that case, we would have to reevaluate this statement. However, since there is, to our knowledge, no such evidence, then this stands as it is. And this is very important because the moment that you open the door and begin to make accusations with no evidence, then you can use this to attack or undermine whatever or whoever you want. For example, Jeremiah and other biblical authors and prophets, they used scribes or stenographers to record their messages. If we accept the idea that because a recorded message does not harmonize with our ideas, therefore the recording is wrong, then you can use that to deny whatever you want. This is also important because anti-Trinitarians like to say, evidence and facts, evidence and facts matter. But when pressed on their denial of this quote, the only thing that they can offer is their own imagination. They will demand that you use only facts and evidence, but they themselves rely on their own speculation. This is called classic projection. Anti-Trinitarians are doing exactly what they accuse others of doing. Furthermore, when Ellen White made the statement, Three Holiest Beings, just three months earlier, she gave another sermon saying that as the saints in the kingdom of God are accepted and when the gold harps are touched and the music flows all through the heavenly host, they fall down and worship. And look at this. Who is it that they worship? The Father, Son, and the Who, and the Holy Spirit. Now, this is a big problem for anti-Trinitarians who claim that the third person is not an actual distinct individual person because how can the saints worship someone that does not really exist? How can you worship some magnetic force or essence? That would be idolatry. But wait, the problem gets even worse because just a few paragraphs later, she cites from Matthew 28, 19 and defines them as three personalities. And she says it not once, but twice. And these three personalities. That is an objective quantity. That is a number. Not four, not two, not two and a half. Three. Three personalities. Anti-Trinitarians really don't like this quote because the word personalities is very specific. That which constitutes an individual, a distinct person, that which constitutes individuality. And if you have spent any amount of time reading through anti-Trinitarian arguments, you will have already noticed that the most common tactic or response is to just ignore this and go somewhere else. They really don't want to spend much time trying to explain this. However, this is important for the topic of this video because this sermon saying that the saints will worship the Holy Spirit and that they are three personalities, just go ahead and take a guess. Try to guess what or where is the geographical location for this sermon. That's right, July 24th, Oakland, California. Now, this is really interesting because Ellen White made all these statements about beings and personalities and worshiping the Holy Spirit, all in Oakland, all within a few months of each other. According to anti-Trinitarians, though, this is because the stenographers or stenographer in Oakland just so happened to miraculously have trouble hearing or recording every time she mentioned the three persons of the Godhead, which, if true, would be statistically amazing. Maybe, maybe every time Ellen White mentioned the Godhead, the stenographer received a text message and lost her concentration. Maybe a dog started to bark, or maybe a little baby started crying at these exact moments, and the stenographer just couldn't hear clearly. I don't know. As of right now, no plausible explanation has been offered. Also notice, this is very interesting, the phrase, three holiest beings, is both immediately preceded and followed by references to all three, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and three great worthies. And it's the same with the other quote, three personalities, also immediately preceded and followed by references to all three, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The context is unmistakable, and notice that in both there is an immediate reference to them as the three great worthies. I will call upon them, and they are the powers in heaven pledged to the church of God. But are these the only statements that she made? What else did she say? There are how many? There are three living persons of the heavenly trio. Not uno, not duo, not quattro, but trio. Three. 
pledge from the three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. She repeated multiple times the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has a personality. He must also be a divine person. The Holy Spirit is a person. We need to realize, she says we need to realize something, and what is it? that the Holy Spirit, who is as much a person as God is a person. The Holy Spirit is a distinct personality. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are how many? They are three distinct agencies, three holy dignitaries, three dignitaries and powers of heaven, three great personal powers, the authorities of heaven, the three great personal dignitaries of heaven, and these three great infinite powers, three representatives of heavenly authority, three great authorities of heaven, three great individual agencies, three great and glorious heavenly characters, three personalities. And what about the pioneers? Anti-Trinitarians like to say that the pioneers, especially while Ellen White was still alive, never supported the Trinity, and they didn't ever claim that the Holy Spirit was a person or being. Are you ready for this? Here we go. Let's start with the Review and Herald. In times eternal when there were no worlds, no created being, not even an angel, in fact, there were only three what? What's the word? Three beings. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. These three persons in the Godhead, both three persons and three beings, are literally in the exact same sentence. This article was on page two, and page one was an article by, guess who? Ellen White. Here we go again with the Review and Herald, titled The Divine Godhead. There are three beings in the Godhead. God the Father, Jesus Christ, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And guess who else wrote in the same issue? That's right, Ellen White. Again, Review and Herald. In an article titled, The Holy Spirit is a Person, it seems strange to me now, in 1898, that I ever believed that the Holy Spirit was only an influence. In view of the work he does, we want the truth because it is the truth, and we reject error because it is error, regardless of any views we may have formally have held or any difficulty we may have had or may now have. When we view the Holy Spirit as a person, light is sown for the righteous. Satan's scheme is to do what? to destroy all faith in the personality of the Godhead, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, also in his own personality. Let us beware lest Satan shall lead us to take the first step in destroying our faith in the personality of this person of the Godhead, the Holy Ghost, and then cites from Ellen White, the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost, we SDA pioneers must ever remember, is more than a divine influence. He is a divine person. He is the what? The co-equal of the Father and the Son. Signs of the times. Paganism, the papacy, and infidelity fail entirely to either rightly know or truly represent the ever-living God. It is left for pure Protestantism to proclaim to the world the true God consisting of three persons, but of one spirit and aim. Stephen Haskell, the doctrine of the Trinity is true when rightly understood. Again, signs of the times, as the church on earth is working by the direct command and agency of the three distinct personages in heaven, that's from an article titled, what? The Trinity. Signs of the times, in the, in the course of the lessons, as opportunity occurs, you will impress upon the children the relation in which they stand to God the Father as the Creator, to God the Son as their Redeemer, and to God the Holy Ghost as their Sanctifier. Again, Review and Herald, the mistake we are making is to teach and preach that the reception of the Holy Ghost is a blessing, influence, endowment, a power, something. It is not any or all these things. It is no thing. He is a person and as such must be received, and not as a blessing of any name nor kind. Receive ye him. Not a blessing, no, no, not anything so low, but the third person in the Godhead. And again, the Review and Herald, read it for yourself. The Holy Ghost, the third person of the Trinity, or this, from the confusing idea of one God and three gods and three gods and one God, the unexplainable dictum of theology, the enemy 
It is the enemy that gladly leads to what appears to be a more rational, though no less erroneous idea, that there is no trinity, and that Christ is merely a created being. But God's great plan is clear and logical. There is a trinity, and in it there are three personalities. These divine persons are closely associated in the work of God. That's also from an article titled, The Trinity. They used the words trinity, persons, and beings repeatedly. Gabriel was only an angel upheld by the same power that sustained John, and he would not for one moment allow John to be deceived by thinking he was part of the great trinity of heaven and worthy of the worship of mankind. And here again in the Review and Herald in an article titled The Trinity, the Godhead is composed of three personal beings and these three are one. Adventist pioneers and official Adventist publications, while Ellen White was still very much alive, publicly and repeatedly affirmed that the Holy Spirit is a person, is a being, and that there is a correct biblical concept of the Trinity. A person is always a being, just like an orange is always a fruit, and a kangaroo is always an animal. You can see this chart right here. This is a timeline from 1844 to 1915, the year that Ellen White died. The circles in orange are at least eight known documented instances when Adventists used the word beings to refer to all three members of the Godhead. And as you can see for yourself, this began happening in the early 1890s, and it happened repeatedly both before and after Ellen White's statement in 1906. So her use of the word beings was certainly not new and was certainly not the last time, and these only represent the known instances. There may be others that we are unaware of, and of these eight times, half of these, or four of them, occur in the Review and Herald in the exact same issue that also included articles from Ellen White. A link to this chart and all references can be found below this video. Anti-Trinitarians are notorious for ignoring all of these other instances and instead try to present the history like this, that it happened only one time and then trying to cast as much doubt and shade and suspicion as possible. They do this because they are stuck. They're stuck in an impossible situation where they are forced to admit that yes, Ellen White and the pioneers used the word person, but that according to them, this person is not a being, something which is refuted by the statements of Ellen White and the pioneers themselves. And it is important to remember that we Adventists do not need Ellen White or the Adventist pioneers to make this conclusion. She and others only affirm the Bible. They affirm the textual evidence that the Holy Spirit is in fact a distinct individual person. Now, to explain why this is so dangerous, unfortunately there are people within the Adventist church who support abortion. This should not come as any great surprise. The tares and the wheat will grow together and almost every organization on planet Earth has people who have odd or different or unorthodox beliefs. This should not be a surprise. These people who support abortion, what they do is they try to distort and use language for the purpose of supporting the horrific act of dismembering little children and anti-Trinitarians. They try to use language for the purpose of dismembering the Godhead. Pro-abortion language leads to the killing of an innocent child, and anti-Trinitarian arguments are dangerous because the effect is to deny and reject the innocent Holy Spirit. He is a distinct individual person and they deny this. They reject him. Now, to be fair, abortionists don't like being called murderers because they have defined in their language that the unborn as non-human. And anti-Trinitarians will no doubt object that they would never try to dismember or murder the Holy Spirit because in their language they are attempting to define the Holy Spirit as a non-person or as a person but non-being. However, if the child is in fact a child, and it is, then the attempt to dehumanize 
sacrifice someone made in the image of God is a serious evil, and if in fact the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead who has, the, who has his own mind, his own will, the capacity to love and fellowship, who teaches, who guides, who comforts, helps and groans, who speaks and brings joy, and who grieves, etc., who can be sinned against, then anti-Trinitarian teaching has as its effect the offensive, insulting, depersonalizing of the Holy Spirit. Ellen White wrote, the prince of the power of evil can be held in check only by the power of God in the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. The only one who can hold the prince of evil in check is the very one who anti-Trinitarians deny. At its core, when you rip the mask off anti-Trinitarian teachings, they are a serious problem, and that's why Adventist pioneers wrote that it is whose scheme? It is Satan's scheme to destroy all faith in the personality of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let us beware, lest Satan shall lead us to take the first step in destroying our faith in the personality of this person of the Godhead, specifically referring to the Holy Spirit. It is amazing to just stop for a moment and think about this and appreciate what happened. All of these statements and articles about the Trinity and about the individuality of the Holy Spirit appeared repeatedly in official publications, and yet there is no warning whatsoever from Ellen White. How do we explain that? No rebuke, no correction, nothing. Notice that anti-Trinitarians, they want us to believe that Ellen White was so sensitive, so fine-tuned, so alert and aware and sensitive enough to detect the and discern the subtle errors in Kellogg's book, but somehow, amazingly, she was oblivious to the supposed blatant errors published publicly and repeatedly in the Review and Herald. Isn't that amazing? If this is as heretical and blasphemous as anti-Trinitarians claim, then why? Why did Ellen White refuse to give even one word of warning or correction when the Holy Spirit was publicly taught as a divine being repeatedly in Adventist publications? Why didn't she see this as a problem? Ask yourself the question. Why do anti-Trinitarians get so triggered and upset by something that apparently never bothered Ellen White? Do anti-Trinitarians have a gift of prophetic understanding even greater than an actual prophet? Ask them for an explanation, and of course, they're not going to offer one. So anyways, in conclusion, based on all of the available evidence, yes, Ellen White spoke in Oakland, California in October 20, 1906 and gave a message that did contain the statement, three holiest beings, referring to all three members of the Godhead, and yes, Ellen White did review the record of her sermon, which she used for her follow-up article just a few weeks later in December. And no, there is no evidence to substantiate the claim that this was an error of the stenographer. Now, it has been my experience, and this has happened repeatedly, that anti-Trinitarians follow a very predictable pattern. Number one, when you share this statement, they outright claim that she did not say it. And then when you show them the evidence, they respond with all sorts of, well, let's look at actual examples so that you can judge for yourself. Typical response number one, just accuse you, don't deceive us with your false information. Typical response number two, misrepresent what you said. Don't you understand, my friend? Ellen White did not write those words. It comes from a stenographer. The problem is not with understanding. Anti-Trinitarians, they understand very well what this evidence means. Ellen White did publish the December 13th article, which specifically refers to her sermon and cites sections verbatim, but they don't want to talk about this evidence, so they keep misrepresenting the facts. Typical response number three, ad hominem, mockery, and exaggeration. Well, well, I just realized we have the pleasure of anti-abortion Andrew with us. Oh yeah, whatever you say goes, you know everything. They can't respond, so they use ad hominem and exaggeration. Typical response number four, the evidence doesn't matter. The idea that Ellen White was a Trinitarian is too insane to deserve any hint of respect. 
these people, they have an idea in their head and any objective facts or evidence that contradicts that idea must not be true. And another good example of this, because typical response number five, you must be a Jesuit. How long have you been a Jesuit goon, Andrew? Andrew, repeat after me, a Jesuit priest disguised as an Adventist. The Ellen White estate is run by Jesuits and they changed many of her writings. So you're, you're probably getting the idea, noticing their method. Anything recorded by a stenographer is wrong, but even if she did write it, it's still wrong because, you know, Jesuits. However, this only creates huge problems because many anti-Trinitarians claim that Adventist church leader Leroy Froome was a Jesuit. In 1946, the trustees of the Ellen White estate published this book here, Evangelism, which is a compilation of statements arranged by topic. And as you can see right here on page 616, there are quotes about the Godhead and right here it says, Eternal Dignitaries of the Trinity. Now the titles and subtitles which you see in bold were added by the trustees of the Ellen White estate because that's what you do with a compilation. But oh no, say anti-Trinitarians. Editors Leroy Froome and Anderson compelled Ellen White's statements, removed their original context and what? And intentionally inserted the word Trinity in subtitles to advance the Trinity doctrine, even though she and all the pioneers were anti-Trinitarian, all capital letters, there are Jesuits in the SDA church. The titles and subtitles, for example, are not her words and are added with intent to deceive. Now, that's extremely serious and I have spent many hours combing through websites, blogs, forums, videos, looking for any actual evidence that Froome belonged to the Jesuit order. And to the surprise of probably nobody, there is no such evidence. It's just slander and character assassination. They claim that Froome was a Jesuit because of this word here printed on page 616. But this creates big problems because an article in the Signs of the Times, 1890, published the Trinity in big bold heading here. Is this because the Jesuits were infiltrating the church even as far back as 1890? According to anti-Trinitarians today, the publication of the word Trinity means that the publisher is a Jesuit. But wait, there's more. In the Union Conference record, there is a Trinity, and in it are three personalities. From an article titled, again, big bold letters, the Trinity. Is this also because of Jesuits? But wait, it gets worse because the Review and Herald in 1899 stated, the Holy Ghost, the third person of the Trinity. This was published in the flagship journal, the Review and Herald, and literally on page one, again, see for yourself, is an article by Ellen White. Here it is again, the Trinity, published in the Review and Herald again with articles from Ellen White, who was still very much alive. Read it for yourself. The Godhead is composed of three personal beings and that these three are one. And again, page one, Ellen White, page two, it says, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, these three persons in the Godhead. And again, in 1913, we Adventists believe in the divine Trinity. The very first belief mentioned, and again, right next to Ellen White's article. Again, ask the question, if Leroy Froome and the trustees of the Ellen White estate were Jesuits because they used the word Trinity in 1946, then how in the world did the Jesuits manage to successfully and repeatedly print the exact same word in so many Adventist publications while Ellen White was still alive? How did that happen? Anti-Trinitarians are so triggered and outraged by this and loudly and repeatedly denounced this as a Jesuit conspiracy, yet none of the pioneers nor Ellen White were outraged at all. They didn't show even the slightest concern. Why is that? If this completely absurd paranoia were true, it would mean that God raised up a prophetic movement to take precious truth to all of the world, but long before Ellen White died, the the leading publications had been poisoned and distorted by Jesuits. This is, of course, complete absurdity. And just because someone has a different theology does not justify slander. 
Even if you believe that your theology is correct and the other person is wrong, that does not make it okay to make nasty, defamatory accusations unless you have actual evidence. The Bible says the Lord hates lying lips and false witnesses. When these people accuse Leroy Froome and others of being a member of the Jesuits, they are doing exactly what the Lord hates. It is an abomination. What they are doing is, by definition, satanic. And Christ will say of them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. How sad will it be? How sad will it be if Leroy Froome enters into the kingdom of God while those who slandered him will be rejected outside as lost and condemned? By the way, if you have not done so, I highly recommend reading Froome's book, The Coming of the Comforter, although maybe because I have already read so many books and material on this topic, I personally didn't find Froome's book spectacular, but it is a good resource to have if you can get it for a low price. Also, W. H. Branson's book, The Holy Spirit, both elders Branson and Froome were contemporaries and both published helpful books on the topic, and although I have both, if I could only get one, I'd get Branson's. Another response is to use a quote from Ellen White with the phrase, only being, and then point at this and say, see, there are no other beings. For example, in The Great Controversy, page 493, she writes, Christ the Word, the only begotten of God, was one with the Eternal Father, one in nature, in character, and in purpose. The only being in all the universe that could enter into all the counsels and purposes of God. And a similar quote in Patriarchs and Prophets, adding, His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Anti-Trinitarians point at this and say, See, Christ was the only being that entered into the counsels of God. Therefore, the Holy Spirit cannot be another being. There are, however, several problems with this. The most obvious is that the Bible states in 1 Corinthians that the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. No one knows the things of God except who? The Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit does not need to enter somewhere if he is already there. He does not need to enter the counsels of God if he is already omnipresent and already knows the things of God. In fact, Ellen White cites directly from this text and says, the Holy Spirit has a personality, else he could not bear witness to our spirits and with our spirits that we are the children of God. He must also be a what? A divine person, else he could not do what? Search out the secrets which are hidden in the mind of God. Furthermore, adopting this super strict ultra-literal approach only causes more problems because she also wrote, Christ only has immortality. And also here, Christ alone is to be exalted. If we are to adopt this extreme, super-literal, super-strict approach to language, then the Father is not immortal and not to be exalted. Ellen White said that only Christ has immortality. So therefore, with the anti-Trinitarian hermeneutic, the Father cannot be immortal. This is also a problem if you do the same thing with the Bible. If the Holy Spirit is not a distinct person, but rather some type of power of God, then many scriptures no longer make any sense because in them the Holy Spirit and his power or the power of God are both mentioned. There are several examples of this. Here we go, Luke 4.14. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee would have to mean Jesus returned in the power of the power of God into Galilee. Also here, Acts chapter 10, 38, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, would mean God anointed Jesus with the power of God and with power. See also Romans 15, 13, 1 Corinthians 2, 4. Another common response is for anti-Trinitarians to strawman and falsely claim that you are building a doctrine on just this one quote. This is so false. The fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church do not cite from Ellen White at all for any of the 28 fundamental beliefs. 
Nobody builds a doctrine off this one quote. That is a false claim. Another very common response is the either or and both fallacy or false dilemmas. Anti-Trinitarians insist that because the writings of Ellen White sometimes identify the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of Christ and of the Father in several statements, that therefore the Holy Spirit can't be a distinct separate person within the Godhead. For example, she wrote, We want the Holy Spirit, which is Jesus Christ. Or this, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. But Ellen White also states, the Holy Spirit is the Comforter in Christ's name. He personifies Christ, yet is a distinct personality. The Holy Spirit can in fact be both the Spirit of Christ as well as being a distinct divine person. This is not a question of either or, but of both and. The Holy Spirit can be both himself and the Spirit of Christ at the same time. And that's a very helpful tip to remember. When interacting with anti-Trinitarians, in their mind, things have to be either this way or that way. It can't be both ways. That's one of the weaknesses in anti-Trinitarian thinking. They believe that they have to be able to explain everything to their own satisfaction. And if they can't explain it, then it must not be true. They have preconceptions how things are supposed to be. And if they can't align the evidence, then they have to claim that the evidence is falsified or corrupted by Jesuits, etc. Another helpful biblical example of the either or and both is the marriage between a man and a woman. The Bible states repeatedly that a man and a woman shall become one flesh. The two shall become one. They both remain as two separate, distinct, individual, personal beings while simultaneously existing as one. Again, this is not the case of either or, but of both and. They are two and they are one at the same time. Another example is in Genesis 1.26, God is described multiple times in the plural. Elohim in the plural. Let us make, plural, our image, our likeness, all in the plural. But in Deuteronomy 6.4, it says that the Lord our God, the Lord is one. God is defined both as a plural and as one at the same time. Again, it's not a matter of either or, but of both and. One of the reasons why anti-Trinitarians are so zealous and eager to spread their claims is because in their mind, the Holy Spirit is actually Lucifer. They believe that there are only two persons, the Father and Son, and that by adding a third person, we are actually making Lucifer or Satan to be a member of the Godhead. For example, it's quite common to hear anti-Trinitarians say this clearly is Lucifer, subtle insinuation of himself into human mind as an equal with Father and Son, or the anti-Trinitarian website as it reads.com in an article titled, Who is the Holy Spirit? stated Lucifer, who is now known as Satan, has come to this earth and has created a deception so great intended for him to receive worship. He has usurped his position and has assumed the identity of a third being of God. He has placed himself to many unknowing as the who? As the Holy Spirit, a separate divine being that receives worship. Or this, Satan is now masquerading himself in the Christian churches as a celestial being called God the Holy Spirit. And through this guise, Satan will orchestrate one of his grandest deceptions. Again, let's take a moment to think this through. If we assume that this is true and that three persons in the Godhead is a demonic deception that leads people to worship Lucifer, then this makes it even more amazing and incredible and remarkable that Ellen White never gave any warning whatsoever. Again, as was stated earlier, these people are so upset and outraged by this supposed heretical blasphemy, but neither Ellen White nor the pioneers showed even the slightest concern. For some reason, they were not bothered with the idea that an apple, orange, and banana are all fruits. 
that persons are always beings, and that brings us to another response. It is also common for anti-Trinitarians to try to use a specific definition from the 1828 Webster Dictionary. This was the common dictionary used at the time, and as you see, the definition for the word person is an individual human being. Man, woman, or child, same thing, human being, human being, fourth definition, a human being, fifth definition, character of office, sixth definition, and then finally, a grammatical term, and then used in law, as an artificial person is a corporation. Anti-Trinitarians will point at definition number six and say, see, the Holy Spirit is not a being, he's just a character of office. But this presents several problems, because as you can see for yourself from the example given, how different is the same man from himself? as he sustains the person of a magistrate and that of a friend. And a really good example for this is Ben Carson. He is a man, a husband, a father, and he is also a doctor. When Dr. Ben Carson goes into the operating room, he is exercising the character of office as a surgeon. But even when he is a surgeon, he is still the man Ben Carson. When he goes into the operating room, his being a man did not cease to exist. In fact, his character of office is only made possible precisely because he exists as a personal being. This very definition necessitates a personal being. By definition, a person is always a being. Furthermore, think about this. If the Holy Spirit is just an office, then how in the world did Mary get pregnant by an office? That's a really, really good question. And although many people have asked this many times, no one has yet to provide an answer. How did an office make a woman pregnant? If that seems confusing to you, just know that you are not alone because I am also just as confused. By the way, if you are ever in a discussion with an anti-Trinitarian, and if they pull out the office definition number six, then you are near the end because they usually won't use this until they are losing ground. They throw this out as a last ditch effort to get you to leave them alone, but if you press them, it has been my experience over and over and over again that they will never try to defend it because they know that it's really weak. They know that it's a loser and that any attempt or effort to try to explain it will only cause them more problems. Now, as you can probably imagine, these responses can cause a lot of mental stress for anti-Trinitarians because they are constantly making claims that are impossible to substantiate or the problem that if they do try to explain something, it makes their claims appear absurd. So in order to avoid all of this hassle and stress, another tactic is to just give the appearance of agreeing with you. They realize that it's just too much of a problem to try to defend their claims. So instead, they take an easier route of pretending that they agree. They will say, Oh, I agree with you. We agree that the Holy Spirit is a person. That's true. And then they will try to slide in their loophole and say, except that he is not an individual person. But individual literally means a single person. So they move again and say, well, he's not a distinct individual person. They will try to keep adding adjectives, trying some way to deny that the Holy Spirit is an actual individual distinct person. But again, Another quote that causes problems is when she cites the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and defines them as three personalities. And you'll notice she does this not just once, she says this twice in the same sentence, both immediately after and immediately before, referring to all three. And by definition, a personality is that which constitutes an individual, a distinct person. And elsewhere, she specifically defines the Holy Spirit as a distinct personality. So the word personality by itself already means distinct. And by adding distinct again as an adjective, you are emphasizing just how distinct the Holy Spirit is, and by definition, distinct is separate, 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 so separated as to not be confounded with any other thing. And right here is a really good time to state again, as Seventh-day Adventists, we do not need Ellen White to know this, as the evidence for this is already in the biblical text. 
In the book of John, chapter 14, verse 16, Jesus is speaking and he gives the promise of sending another comforter. Some versions read helper, advocate, or counselor. The Greek word is parakleto, sometimes said as paraclete. This word here, another, when Jesus says there will be another parakletos, he specifically uses the Greek word alos, meaning same as or another of the same sort, rather than heteros, which means another of a different sort. There are two comforters, two paracletes, two advocates. Jesus is defined as a paraclete and the Holy Spirit is also defined as a paraclete by the exact same author. Both Christ and the Holy Spirit are two separate, individual, distinct advocates. There are two, not one, and that's why Ellen White correctly says that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. And if Jesus is God and the Holy Spirit is Allos, another of the same sort, then the Holy Spirit, by definition, is also God. And if, as Jesus said in John 10, 30, I and my Father are one, then the Holy Spirit is equal to the Father as well. The Bible says that the scriptures are inspired by the Holy Spirit. So take a moment to stop and think that through. If the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit, and the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is another of the same sort, then by denying that the Holy Spirit is the third person is to reject and to deny the very way that the Holy Spirit has defined himself. And yes, while there is much that we do not know about him, this does not mean that we have zero information. The Bible gives us a lot of information describing the Holy Spirit as one who speaks, who searches, who guides, who can be insulted, who can be grieved, who can be sinned against, who commands and forbids, etc., etc. It was the Holy Spirit who conceived Jesus in the womb of Mary, and it was the Spirit who resurrected Jesus from the dead. At the baptism of Jesus, the Holy Spirit appears as a dove, very distinct and separate from Jesus himself, and very distinct and separate from the voice from heaven. When Jesus is baptized, there are two separate witnesses. The Bible specifically says that the Holy Spirit has a will of his own. He has intelligence. He has knowledge. The Holy Spirit has a mind, and he has the capacity for love. These are the very characteristics of not just a person, but a divine person. So when people today reject this, they are rejecting the very way that the Holy Spirit has defined himself. This, of course, causes all sorts of problems because if the Holy Spirit is not an accurate authority to describe himself, then how can we trust the Holy Spirit to accurately inspire the rest of the Bible. If the Holy Spirit has not accurately revealed truthful descriptions about himself, then how are we to have confidence in any other biblical truth? Anti-Trinitarian arguments generally try to attain the appearance of legitimacy by remaining as vague and nebulous as possible. Anti-Trinitarians do not like to give definitions for their terms because they know that if they do so, they will get pinned down by the definition. And an excellent example of this is the word itself, Trinity. It's very common for anti-Trinitarians to attack the Adventist church and claim that we have accepted the pagan doctrine of the Trinity. And a great way to respond to this is by simply asking for a definition for this word. What does the word Trinity mean? And it's been my experience and doubtless will be the same for you that the overwhelming majority of the time, they won't give you a definition because doing so will make it very difficult for them to continue to attack. For example, in addition to the concept of the three person Godhead, the word Trinity, according to modern dictionaries, simply means a group of three closely related persons or things, a group of three, a group of three things or people. So when anti-Trinitarians accuse you of believing some pagan doctrine, just ask them, if they are not three persons, then what are they? Three what? Three kangaroos? Three magnetic forces? Three what? Again, you will not get a definition because the whole goal is to try to heap as much negative connotation as possible 
on the word Trinity itself and try to charge it with as much negative voodoo as possible so that simply using the word becomes in itself its own end. But this is absurd. Furthermore, in addition to the word Trinity, we Adventists share many other similar words with other religions or denominations. A great example is the word soul. When Catholics use the word soul, they don't mean exactly what Adventists mean, but simply because we share the same common language of English and share the same word soul, which also has tremendous theological significance, this does not mean that we should stop using the word soul. No, we simply provide and define the word according to the biblical evidence, and it's the same with the word trinity. Another great example is the word uh, what's another great example? Millennium. Although the word millennium and other words are not in the Bible, the subject is there and the word is used to simply describe the subject or concept. Same with the word Trinity. Although the word is not in the Bible, there is a description of God as three persons. The word Trinity simply describes the concept. And just as there are true and false teachings of the millennium, this does not and should not stop us from using the word millennium. It's also quite common for anti-Trinitarians to accuse and say, Catholics also believe in the Trinity. But this is absurd for all sorts of reasons. Number one, Adventists and Catholics both agree on the virgin birth of Jesus and his bodily resurrection. Should we abandon these beliefs also simply because we share this in common? Should we abandon the Sabbath because Seventh-day Baptists also honor the Fourth Commandment? Jehovah Witnesses share with us the same belief about the state of the dead. Should we abandon that too? The common anti-Trinitarian attempted guilt by association does not work. And another reason that this is absurd is that if the use of shared words and language like Trinity or God or soul is by itself the problem, then we will have to abandon English language and come up with our own language, in which case nobody would understand us, which is again absurd. No, if we share similar words or phrases, we simply provide what we believe is a more accurate and biblical definition. Another very obvious problem is the word three, the number three. This is a very big problem for anti-Trinitarians because numbers don't have different definitions that are affected by changes in culture over time. The number three during the time of Moses meant exactly three. During the time of Paul, it meant three. And during the time of the Adventist pioneers, and even today, it means exactly three. This is a problem because when Ellen White described the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as three persons and as three personalities, she is putting them all in the same category. She identifies what they are, persons, and then enumerates them as three in quantity. The three living persons of the heavenly trio and also trio, like the word trinity, has the same definition, a group of three persons or things. They like to say, Ellen White never used the word Trinity. Well, okay, fine, no problem. But she did use the word three, and she did use the word trio. So what exactly are the three things or persons who make up this trio? The reason that anti-Trinitarians get so upset with the quote, the three holiest beings, is because they are trying desperately through word magic to keep the Holy Spirit in the person category, but somehow at the same time remove him, which is impossible. They can't deny that Ellen White defined him as a person, so they try to somehow acknowledge this, but simultaneously claim that he somehow belongs in a totally separate category, which would make no sense because by definition, they are all three of the same category. A really good question to ask and credit to Chris Chung for this question is this, I just ate my third pancake, how many pancakes did I eat? One, two, three, or other? Anti-Trinitarians do not like to answer this question because if they admit that you ate three pancakes, they will be admitting that the word third identifies all three as of the same category. Pancakes. Ellen White, in harmony with the biblical text, says that there are three divine persons in the Godhead, while anti-Trinitarians talk as if there are only two. They say, you can't have 
three in one God, but you can have two. They say it's wrong to have a trinity or trio, but it's okay to have a duo. They say trinity is bad, but the twinity is okay because somehow the third pancake actually means that there are only two pancakes plus a spiritually manifested pancake that's not really a pancake because it's only a presence or power. So we have two pancakes plus a manifested power pancake that is actually the second pancake. Now, of course, if people want to believe this, then they are free to do so, but that does not make it okay to then go and publicly publish all sorts of blatantly false claims and accuse people of being Jesuits. Anti-Trinitarians also have an additional problem because they love to say that they are following the pioneers but not only do they consistently refuse to explain why the pioneers repeatedly used the word Trinity and defined all three persons as beings, but, and notice this, they can't provide any evidence that any of the pioneers ever defined three persons as two beings. You notice that? They are adamant that somehow Three means two, yet despite their best efforts, they have never been able to find any evidence that any of the pioneers anywhere ever understood three persons to actually mean two beings. They will constantly accuse Adventists of rejecting the pioneers, but that is exactly what they do. This is, again, classic projection. Accuse others of what they themselves are doing. They will accuse you of ignoring evidence and that's exactly what they do. It's just constant projection. Furthermore, as Seventh-day Adventists, we do not believe something simply because the pioneers believed it. That would be to follow in the footsteps of Rome and Catholicism, which bases a large portion of their beliefs on what the church fathers taught, not what the Bible teaches. When confronted with the evidence, another typical response is to concede, well, okay, maybe Ellen White did say that, or yes, the pioneers, did write that, but it doesn't mean what you think it means. Many anti-Trinitarians have a magical dictionary with definitions that change and fluctuate with each statement. Person doesn't always mean person, and three doesn't always mean three. But using magical dictionaries causes huge problems because if even basic numbers like three don't mean what we think they mean, then how in the world are we to understand anything? Just like the, just like the Tower of Babel, all communication breaks down instantly and nothing can be understood and you are left with nothing but confusion, disunity, and disorder. Anyways, that's enough for this video. I know, yes, of course, a lot more could be said, but I believe I've covered all the major points. So in summary, based on all of the available evidence, yes, Ellen White did say, three holiest beings and anti-Trinitarians have never provided any evidence to substantiate their claim. As has been documented, the published materials by the anti-Trinitarian community repeatedly make false and misleading statements and sadly and unfortunately, very often, even when you do provide the facts and evidence, many of them just double down and keep repeating it or without a single shred of evidence, accuse you of being a Jesuit, etc., which is very unfortunate. So thank you for watching. And if you want to comment below about the three holiest beings or the biblical evidence about the Holy Spirit, please keep it on topic. Thank you very much.